Hey, this is the uh, Ben Around the World podcast uh, interview episode nine, um, where I catch up with fellow in- adventurers that I meet along the road, but also those that I hope to meet. <laughs> and that's one today. I've uh, got a very special guest. Uh, he's not only cycling around the world right now, but he beforehand, he was uh, the youngest Brit to climb all the seven peaks across all the continents of the world. And uh, he's the author of a book, In Search of Sisu. Uh, it's Geordie Stewart. Hey, man, how you doing? Hi, Ben. How you doing? I'm very well, thanks. I'm not too bad. Thanks for joining me this morning. Whereabouts, uh, whereabouts are you now? Uh, I'm in Singapore, which is very exciting. Oh. Yeah, so oh. I cycled, uh, what, 21,000 kilometers or so from London. Um, and yeah, so across Europe and across Asia. So I'm very happy here right now. It's a nice break. For me, like Singapore was a big checkpoint on the route because it was quite clear to the end of Asia or continental Asia. Um, so yeah, it's very nice. I'm staying with a friend. So it's nice to just have a bit of downtime. Yes. And it's good to get you on a solid internet connection as well. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I've had some very, I'm sure you have as well. Some rope yeah. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of the other podcasts we seem to just call in on some 3G connection in, in Thailand or something like that. But through something or a VPN in China or something. It's, yeah. Yeah, oh God, it's absolute chaos. I have to deal with that at some point. Before we get into the cycling side of the trip, obviously I'm just I'm about halfway through your book at the moment, so I'm reading about your uh, your Seven Summits adventure, which is pretty incredible. Um, how did the, the idea of that uh, trip come about? Oh, the Seven Summits trip, yeah. it's um, So I was 17. I had, well, no climbing experience at the time. I sort of, as a kid, I, I enjoyed going outdoors and running around, I had a lot of energy, but I hadn't done any big climbing, but I read uh, Bear Grylls' book, uh, Facing Up, and it was about his ascent of Everest when he was, I think, what, 23, 24 or something. And I thought it was a good idea. Um, And I was genuinely halfway through the book and it just, I don't know whether it was like him or the story or the mountain, whatever it was, uh, and it just struck a chord. Um, So I thought, yes, Everest, let's try and do that. And then, you know, like all, you know, good people distracting themselves from exams. I was going to Wikipedia and then I read about the Seven Summits, which is the highest mountain on every continent. And I thought, yeah, that's what we've got to go towards. Um, And it just, it seemed an amazing, well, an amazing journey in itself, an amazing adventure, but also it, it was like perfect preparation for Everest, which if you put Everest as the end goal, because it was the highest and in theory the hardest, then the others sort of worked up to it. Um, it didn't exactly work out that way, but it was a nice theory. But yeah, so I had no experience. I read a book and then thought, um, yeah, let's aim towards that. Wow. So with no experience, how do you learn to to climb some of the most extreme points on the earth? Uh, yeah, it's not the recommended approach. I, <laughs> if I, were to, I, I, well, I wholeheartedly believe that, you know, you can... Uh, get inspired by something and learn the skills and learn and then get the experience to try it so i believe in that but it's easier to have an experience of something develop the skills and then be like okay i want to for example climb everest um but yeah so i i rashly booked onto a climb in south america to climb aconcagua which is the, it's the highest mountain outside the Himalayas. so it's a it's a big old big old beast um but i thought i would book that and it would just sort of commit me to try and follow through with it and then i basically backtracked and said okay you need to learn these skills you need to get this experience you need to raise that much money uh and i sort of then carried on doing it like that so i've gone an expedition realized what extra skills i needed to do and it's a yeah it's a great great uh experience but even with app on kagua i you know, I had to lie on my application form because I didn't have the experience. Um, I didn't have the experience to go on the expedition based on their parameters for what you should do. Because I was 17 and had never been to how to do it at all. So you have to say you've done X, Y, Z. Um, wow. And thanks. I, I mean, thanks yeah. for it out okay. But it, like, as I said, it's not the recommended approach. Because obviously there's a base level of, of fitness which you can train for wherever you are. But what are the other challenges? Obviously, there's altitude, dealing with altitude, which is it's quite hard to get yeah. to get to 5,000 meters in, in the UK, however hard you try. And uh, what other challenges did you meet? Like, did you have to do ice climbing or rope work or all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so there's, a, I mean, there's basic, like, mountaineering skills. And sometimes, you know, the actual skills, 
I had and still have are far above what you needed for the seven summits, which are not technical climbs. But it's often with all of these things, it's like, okay, I would rather feel like I'm better prepared in terms of my own skill set and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, okay. You know, so for example, if you're if you're having a if you're on a genuinely precarious rock step or you're slipping down some ice, I'd rather I'd rather have the skills and be able to adapt to that because I've got enough experience that I can go through that mm. than be in that situation and be like, I honestly don't know what to do here. Um, which is which is an obvious thing. So I in some ways overtrain, but the hard thing that you can't really teach is experience. Um, and that just comes with just hours of being on mountains in different conditions and stuff like that. But, you know, in terms of um, those expeditions, there's a, there's a huge amount of, of difficulties. The high altitude is a big one, and certainly my training changed because I didn't know what I was doing before. I would run a lot, and I was really fast uh, at running, but I wasn't climbing fit. And then it just changed and changed over the years. So by the time I eventually got back to Everest for the second attempt, I was – I was like climbing fit, um, which basically just by that, I mean, you can just spend hours and hours outdoors and yeah. in different conditions with a big rucksack on. And the only way to really gain that sort of strength, either mental or physical, is just by doing it. Um, That's you know, interesting. Yeah, so it's a different kind of fitness to the to the fast twitch running. Well, exactly. It's a totally different, well, certainly, but it's like cycling, okay? If you... I cycle a lot back in the UK anyway, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later. But you can, you know, smash out an hour and a half on Sufferfest on a Watt bike and be like, okay, I am super fit and my VO2 max is flying high up to 70 or something and I'm feeling really good and my lactic ability is is strong. But that doesn't teach you how to spend six, seven, eight hours a day cycling. Yeah. Cycling and stop in 15 minutes having a bite to eat and then just doing that not just once but like day after day after day and the only way you can build up that sort of stamina is by just doing it day after day and then you build up the, the muscle memory um so it took a bit of time certainly with those clients to start to build up that sort of you know physiological knowledge but i suppose you you get a lot of that experience in some of the expeditions i was when i was reading um yesterday and it seems like you spend quite a lot of time with, if you just ignore the actual summit, you spend weeks, if not months, of shipping kit around, and, yeah. and that, that seems like a big part of the expedition that people don't see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, if you're looking for risk versus reward in terms of time spent on the summit, then mountain climbing is one of the most illogical activities. <laughs> you know, I was very lucky. You know, certainly on Everest, I spent a long time on the summit, but other ones. I remember when I, you know, when I Kilimanjaro or actually Elbrus, which is you know highest in Europe, it was a complete whiteout. Kilimanjaro, I summoned it when I was dark. So you're, you're the highest point in Africa, the highest point in Europe, and actually your visibility is like half a meter. So it was, and Kili was really hot, um, really cold, and Elbrus was really cold. So you literally get up, a couple of pictures, and head back down again. Uh, whereas other ones are beautiful, and Denali in Alaska was like the most perfect day and so you're happily spending an hour and a half up there um and then it seems totally worthwhile but sometimes i look back at those old summit pictures and go that <laughs> that really wasn't the view it's that i was moment <laughs> yeah wow that's interesting so um the point that i left the book last night you it was actually um after oh no i've got a bit further but uh, after climbing kilimanjaro the second peak that you climbed and uh it's an interesting juxtaposition because um when you think about, especially things like Everest expeditions, you you know you see a lot of uh, bankers or retirees with a lot of you know a lot of extra cash because you need a lot of money to deal with those expeditions. And obviously, you were uh, seventeen, eighteen, uh, just working uh, working a job back yeah. in the UK. You were funding it yourself, and so you mentioned in the book that after climbing Kilimanjaro, you were basically out of money and uh, sleeping rough, <laughs> trying to trying to get home. How was that? How was your funding for the trip? So, that, yeah, funding for those expeditions is its one of the most difficult bits to explain to people, but also the hardest hardest part of those whole climbs, really. I mean, the, the whole, those seven summits took about four years or something. And actually, if you look at the, the time spent 
on the climbs themselves, minimal amounts. The reason it took so long was to basically get the funds for it. Um, and certainly the first four climbs, so North, South America, Africa, Europe, um, I just funded myself. You know, I made the decision that I wanted to do these climbs. And then I was working a whole range of jobs um, from not particularly glamorous ones in warehouses, you know, packing up like bathroom accessories to working marquees to working as interior designer, you know, putting up carpets or cool centers. I mean, uh, it's it's good learning curve. Um, yeah. It's certainly not glamorous and it, it served the purpose. And I was very, very set on what I wanted to do. So I wouldn't mind working six, seven days a week, you know, catering or putting up marquees or whatever, because, and I, the other side is you have to sacrifice a huge amount as well. So you look back, you know, 10, 12 years on, and you go, well, I'm really glad, you know, I didn't need that weekend blowout in London or something. But every weekend blowout in London I could have spent is, I don't know, 50, 100, 200 quid, something like that. And actually, that's like, in my mind, it was 200 quid, which would be spent on a new ice axe or yeah. equipment I needed or a visa for a new country. And I, that's honestly how I thought for a long time which is a very difficult mindset to get out of actually. Um, but yeah, so the first four, I just relentlessly worked and funded it myself. And then you get to a stage where you basically, I didn't have the financial backing. And so you need sponsors to be able to do it. Um, Cause Everest and certainly Antarctica and Indonesia, those three climbs are all super remote. And um, because of that, the logistical costs go up hugely. So yeah, you need to get sponsors, which is a very thankless task. Uh, and it just requires just days and weeks and hours, just churning away online, sending emails, calling people. And it's a really, it's, yeah, it's, you really have to put yourself out there. And I had, I had a great friend who helped me and people like that. But at the end of the day, I'm the one I've had to call and, you know, make up these absurd farcical stories about trying to get meetings with people which is you know funny in hindsight but it's also draining you know when you go to shops and supermarkets and car dealerships day after day with your big sponsorship dossier and like right and each one you have to treat is the one you know and yeah. I, I did i believe it i'd be like well, this is the one this is the one that's going to make this happen um and then you just get emails back or no response saying no, no, no. And it's, um, yeah, it's pretty demoralizing actually. And I, yeah, I funded these, I got the actual money for the trip so close to when I went. Like the final Everest one was about 10 days before I departed. Wow. I, was, I don't know, 15 grand behind. I remember for Indonesia, I ended up paying someone about 10 grand in cash at a very dodgy airport in the middle of um, Western Papua because she i honestly it was this local outfitter and i got the money so close before going and um that i couldn't they didn't want the money online so i was like okay well let's just sort out a, <laughs> a, a cash in hand swap yeah, in hand. <laughs> no questions asked um, wow which yeah but that's that was the nature of doing it um it's amazing how much a deadline provokes action both in yourself and in other people um but it yeah. was very unrelaxing it sounds like you have a, a very good singular focus though off the back of you know but if you once you book the expedition that gives you a real motivation and you're seem like the person kind of person that will really really follow that uh yeah i, I guess i guess it, it's certainly if i book something it does it does provoke action um because otherwise you spend you know it's like a lot of people ask about cycling trips like you know how do you actually start on a big trip and I, yeah, an obvious thing is to set a departure date and if you set a departure date and tell people then you're you're, you're kind of screwed socially um, yeah. the thing with those climbs was i had no pressure because I, nobody knew i was doing them certainly the first three i think other than my family no one knew because i would just go up the mountain and i didn't have social media or anything like that and i would just go up the mountain and come back and so there was no pressure and then suddenly in order to get sponsorship, you need to build more of a profile. In order to build a profile, you need to tell people about it. And mm -hmm. if you tell people about it, you then have this more of an obligation to do it. And again, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but there's a whole different thing with with this sort of expedition where yeah. you actually, it's a, it's a different mindset, the cycling side. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the climbing, did you find a real difference between the climbing when you were purely doing it for yourself, no social media, anything, to when you had to have that public perception? Did it change? Did it change what the expedition was like and how you felt about reaching the summit and your daily, you know, what you what you were thinking about mentally on a daily basis? Um, it it kind of did actually, I guess. But then again, I you know the way I use social media and certainly tracking on the cycling trip. I film a lot when I cycle and I do a lot of Instagram stories and stuff like that. And I'm very happy filming. And yeah. with those old climbing expeditions, I used to film them in exactly the same way. And it wasn't that common at the time, but I just had a digital camera and I would shove it in my face and, you know, just happily chat to it. And for me, it was quite a good companion often that I could just talk to. Yeah, your no-name friend. It's also very good to remind yourself if you're feeling rubbish, you know, because you come back from an expedition and you go, that was, that was wonderful. What a great thing to go through. And then you need to look at the videos and go, no, don't like it. <laughs> You're feeling rubbish. So it's quite, it's got a good little uh, memory trigger. But yeah, I, I don't know. I Even on this trip and in those, I don't feel like it dominates the way I do it at all. I just sort of happily, you know, happily cycle along or climb and chat. And it makes no difference. I just probably click share to more people now than I did before. But um, that's interesting yeah i know some people really they just they want to do these adventures to get away from technology and social media and all that kind of stuff yeah, but yeah. i don't know i feel like you know you can go cold turkey for like a week or something but actually there are benefits of having it in your life it's interesting to hear about your your idea of having having the record of the times that you were you were having a bad time not just the good yeah. times well can, there's also so about the whole getting away thing i think if i had a super stressful busy job in london and actually, when I was working in the army before here, I would get so annoyed with WhatsApp groups organizing everything that I loved going away. And, you know, I would go to the coast of Sweden or go up to Scotland or something. And then you switch off and be like, isn't it a joy to not have social media? Mm. But it's very different when you're physically removed and you're on a trip like we're on. Actually, that social media link and WhatsApp and being in touch with your friends is hugely important. Yeah. For me, it is anyway. Not just because of the sort of dopamine hit of people clicking like. It's not. It's just the connectivity you have to your friends, mm. which is, I think, hugely important. And, you know, you can go cold turkey on a trip like we're on, but, I, like, what's the point? In yeah. some ways, because I, I don't feel like I'm – I don't feel like it's dominating my life at all because if it was, I would just turn it off. But I'm not. I'm happily cycling away. And I know there'll be times when I don't have – social media or whatever because i'll be in the middle of the outback or the middle of kazakhstan or something so you'll be forced into not having it but that's fine it's hey i think i think it's the way it, i don't know i think instagram's a catch-22 really but a lot it gets a lot of criticism but i think it just depends how you use it it's yes. uh, you know if you keep following people who who put up a completely filtered existence then you'll probably feel bad about it so just don't follow them and I, and I admit it is an incredibly dangerous tool mm. you know for a lot of, for a lot of reasons but just just click on follow and follow people who make you feel good or who interest you that's an interesting point yeah i mean personally i stopped i i really stopped consuming facebook and instagram about two years ago because whenever i especially the facebook feed when i got on there um, I just found that I felt bad, you know, yeah. after about five minutes scrolling down the feed, I just felt that like, even if I was doing something amazing, you know, I was running a company, I was traveling to the States, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but somehow even yeah. however objectively my life seemed good, like scrolling down the timeline made me feel depressed and sad yeah. and not sufficient. But, but then funnily enough, now I'm kind of almost the reverse. Like I rarely look at the feed, but I actually, I'm now probably the responsible for a lot of that because every video is me in another country cycling around or yeah. paragliding, all this kind of stuff. But I'm trying now more, especially um, with some of the videos on coming out on YouTube in the next few months of about talking about the bad times, about, you know, being incredibly depressed and alone in some random Indian village after cycling a thousand kilometers away from the nearest yeah, yeah. Big town, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I'm hoping to try and share a bit more about the, the that side as well and just have good conversations. I think that that um, that's often missed out. It's a lot of like um, trying to pretty up your life and 
show the really vain sides of things, but actually uh, you know, there's real people behind a lot of those posts. So if you can find the right people and people are willing to share the tough times as well, I think it's there's still a lot of benefit there to those communities. Yeah, 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 agree entirely. And that's why I like the Instagram stories because I don't mind sharing, you know, one day videos of me feeling and looking rubbish mm. because I don't mind filming that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic anyway. But I, you know, I went off social media certainly after those climbs because there was a load of media stuff after I did those seven summits, and I, I just wanted to join the army, and for a number of reasons. But I wanted to join the army and just not have and not tell anyone about those climbs and not discuss it at all. So mm. I didn't, and I just deleted social media. And yeah, if you Google me, you've been you'd find out, which some people eventually did, but. I was happy just doing my job and not having Twitter or Instagram or Facebook really. Yeah. And then it was only when I was, well, this time last year, pretty much when I started writing the book and realized you actually need to tell the book that I started Instagram again. So I've only been on it a year. Um, but hey, it's an interesting that, world. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned in the book is how early on you, you struggle with uh, an eating disorder. And uh, do you think that the the kind of your attitude towards the adventure side of things helped you overcome parts of that? Uh, yeah, so that's that's a funny balance. That um, yeah, I did. I mean, when I was what sixteen, I guess for three or four years, I had a really bad eating disorder. Which I think eating disorders and bulimia and things like that are really they're really dangerous. Um, and the, you know, it's something that I've weighed up a lot and probably when i return to the uk i'll discuss it more because i think it's mm. it, mental health problems get a lot of airtime nowadays um which is really important and certainly there's an image amongst males there's you know traditional you know stoic british image of like never show weakness and like you know alpha male stuff which i've never endorsed or been a fan of anyway but it's partly why I wrote that book in the way I did, because I thought it was quite important to, to show the other side of it. Um, mm. yeah, eating disorders are really dangerous, but I think there's a, there's a big discussion about, um, you know, an increase in mental health in people, which is an important discussion. I do think it's an important discussion and it's important that people are open about it because I think that people need to be open in order to raise conversations about these issues and, through those conversations is how you're actually going to help yourself. Um, but yeah, from my perspective, for a number of reasons that came about, and you can go into the psychology of why people get mental health problems or with addictive personalities or things like that. But the eating disorders are very dangerous because they're very all consuming and it's a very well generic part of how you exist really, you know, mm. to consume food. So it's a very really dangerous thing to do, but those climbs, they were, intrinsically linked but also you know mutually exclusive as well i wasn't climbing because i had bulimia but i equally i didn't have bulimia because i wanted to climb or things like that they, they were separate and i think the process of it was also you know the common time to get those sort of issues it's the same reason people start drinking or smoking or start to take drugs or things like that are in your you know late teenage years traditionally or mid teenage years because you're always searching for some sort of identity or to be different or to rebel or things like that and to an extent i probably picked those climbs because they were interesting and they would maybe differentiate yourself from other people and things like that and then uh i guess the process of just growing up and then you achieve something that's a bit different and, you know, you suddenly went to university and I actually loved it and met the most amazing group of friends and, you know, did everything you do at university um, in terms of alcohol and having fun with people and, you know, just everything you'd expect at university. And I think all of those things combined are all just part of growing up. So then you end up in a better headspace. Yeah. But I think yeah. it's an important thing to talk about. Yeah, that's what I really found and I really appreciated about the book, really. You just dived into it in such an honest way. And I think it's obviously something that a lot of people could just skip in a, in a book about, you know, their adventurous triumphs as a, as a teenager. But obviously, it's a, a part of your life. And um, there's a, I imagine there's a lot of other people um, suffering with eating disorders 
uh, a lot of other men as well who, like you say, it's it's not uh, done to talk about that kind of thing. And then, you know, obviously mental health um, issues have been talked about a lot more. And I just, I, f I just find it incredibly uh, uh, heartening to hear those stories. Not heartening, it, obviously, that they, they happen, but heartening that people are actually feeling that they can talk about it now. And um, yeah. yeah, like I say, I'm going to try and talk, I'm going to try and be talk about it more because, um, because, you know, dealt with depression and uh, in my life and doing adventures like this I think in the depression context can really I think adventures for me anyway this may may not I'm not talking for you here but for me I find that traveling like this doing big adventures they really they strengthen all feelings right so yeah. um, when when I feel good I feel I felt the most euphoric I've ever felt when I've you know I've reached a, a, a pass in Turkey 2,000 meter climb um, you know that I've um, I've been cycling for a month solidly, so I feel the fittest I've ever been. Someone stops and is handing you food on the way uh, to the climb, and you just get to the top. You see this beautiful landscape. Um, I was at one part of Turkey where there's the highest mountain in Turkey in the distance. This um, this uh, Persian palace on the other side of the thing. You know, feel absolutely on top of the world. And then on the flip side, you know, when when you come down, when I've uh, when I've been traveling through central India for for a month and I've not met anyone who's been able to speak my language properly or, or be able to communicate with me on, on my level for about that amount of time. I've not spoken to family. I've not spoken to friends for, for a long time. And I just get struck by this huge wave of depression. And I just, you know, don't want to get out of the tent in the morning. And uh, I think, you know, adventure gives you both those sides of the coin. And a lot of people talk about one side, but they don't talk about the other. So I was very appreciative of your honesty there about, uh, about those struggles you had. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, it was important. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with your experience as well. Just especially on like a solo cycle trip, the spectrum of emotion is it's intense. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I respect anyone that goes cycle touring, especially by themselves, because I'm like, whoever you are, I, I don't believe you can go through these trips by yourself and not have like there in terms of emotion. It's, like, it's unavoidable. Um, but yeah, it was really hard to write about that stuff because I hadn't told anyone in like, 10 years. I think two, two, three people in the world knew, um, which were pretty much ex-girlfriends of mine, and that was it. Uh, and that's really hard. So it, it threw a lot of people a curveball. Um, yeah. But, which is why it was quite so emotional to write and why I cared about the book so much. But I think think it's really important. So there was part of me that, you know, discussed that because I was like, it's important for me to actually come to terms with that. And I honestly think it took that much, you know, to that much introspection to write the book to actually not get over it. Because in many ways, I don't think you actually can get over eating disorders problem. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, you need to confront it. And that was doing that. But there's also a side which I knew would would give other people a sense of relatability and that was important because that's not a you know doing it wholly in our reasons but i knew that it would have an impact a positive, uh, hopefully a positive impact of people who have maybe gone through the same thing so i thought they were both important i also got to be l lying if i didn't include it mm. because i could have written that book when i was 22 and be like great you know this is what i did i wanted to climb these mountains when i was 17 and then did it when i was 22 you know pat on the back well done you had a bit of a crap time on everest the first attempt but then you got there you know well done but actually that's like that's not a story like who are you kidding and i i, I just i wrote them i'm about to put up a blog soon actually about like just reflections on this trip and a part of me was there was a there's a tiny section about like, who are you kidding about things that you do? And it annoys me when people say they've done something. I'm like, but you're lying to yourself here. You've either actually lied to yourself or you're actively lying to other people. And I, I find it, I find it odd. And certainly when I was trying to recount that trip or those few years, I'm like, that was an important part of it. So you've got to be honest about that. Um, so yeah. I'm glad yeah. So yeah. So talking, going to the cycling side now, um, yeah. What was the what's the origins of the the cycling trip you are doing now? Um, yes, yeah, so I I had a few friends who were who had done a big cycle before, and so I think there was an idea of long distance cycling that I thought was interesting. 
but I never, I genuinely thought <laughs> that what they were doing was a very pure adventure and a very real adventure and hard because they're by themselves and they're in these different countries and couldn't speak the language. And I was like, I don't think I, don't think I could do that. This was five, 10 years ago. I was like, that's too much for me. Um, and then fundamentally, I was, I decided I wanted to leave the army because um, I didn't want to spend my career there and I found it a little bit, you know, constraining. Mm. And I looked at normal jobs, you know, proper jobs in London and, you know, wear a suit and actually get up in the morning and be organised and earn a decent salary. And then I sort of got to the stage where I was like, ah, just, I think you can be honest with yourself. And so I decided to take a totally different approach, which was, I then, well, I then started writing the book, um, but I I thought that it'd be a good idea to go off on a big cycle trip. So I started to save money and then, yeah, I came out here the day I left the army, so August the 9th, um, mm. which was cool. So I just sort of felt very liberated, but it was very, <laughs> very hectic a few weeks before I came out because I was, so totally absorbed by finishing the book and that published like a few weeks before I came on this trip. Wow. So I, I hadn't even considered this trip really, other than like, what are you doing when you're leaving the army? Well, I'm going off on a big cycle trip. Other than like whimsically saying that, mm -hmm. I had done nothing until about two or three weeks before coming out. I had no kit. And so then I went <laughs> very hectic few weeks to well, buy a bike, buy panniers, buy a wow. tent, all of this stuff. Impressive. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it was very good because a lot of people like the hardest bit is to actually get out the front door, whereas for me yeah. it wasn't because it was just such a frenetic few weeks. I didn't even have time to think, really. It was just like more Amazon deliveries coming left, right and centre and then be like, right, I've got to fit a rack, but I don't know how to do that, so that's going to take... And just suddenly... And then... That last bit of kit arrived like the day before I left. I was like, right, well, I think we're going to be heavy on, heavy on tomorrow. Because I gave myself this deadline of August the 9th. And then, uh, oh, yeah, very hectic. Wow, and yeah, that's impressive. It means I didn't think about what I was doing. Because other people I know have been like, I've been planning this for two or three years. And I've got exactly the right kit. And I look at them mm. set off and I'm like, you do have exactly the right kit. Whereas I absolutely don't. But <laughs> um, it sort of works. That's interesting. That's an interesting one to, for me because um, on uh, an, another part of this podcast, I speak to my friend Dan. He's the sort of regular catch up I have, and uh, a friend back, uh, a friend and a colleague uh, back in London. Yeah. And um, one of our kind of regular segments when I catch up with him is about kit that I've bought and kit that I've lost because I spend probably a bit a m much longer than you kind of planning, and I've got a spreadsheet with all the kit that I need yeah. um, before I left. But what I found is that when I had a lot of time beforehand, you know, months twiddling, looking on Amazon, oh, you know, oh yeah, what I really need is like a inflatable pillow and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, an extra pair of like thermal, extra set of thermal jerseys or whatever, or a, a digital, you know, I need a really good um, digital camera so that I can do my, all my YouTube videos in super high quality. Yeah. And then uh, if there's some photos from me when I left where I literally couldn't fit everything in my bags and I've got a huge pannier bag with my, paraglider in so like i've got an unbelievable amount of kit and so within the first month it was almost a joke with me and dan about how much kit i'd uh, listing all the kit that i'd sold on ebay and yeah. gone to like an austrian post office to send back and that kind of thing <laughs> so what is there any kit that you wish that you'd got or you found most useful and the kit that you've maybe lost along the way or uh, chucked in a bin along the way uh yeah <laughs> there's been a few that have chucked in the bin what did I get rid of very early in France? I actually, you know, I had a, a diary, a thick diary. I got rid of that because I realized I was I just, I, was, I wasn't going to sit down and, and write every day, like write, write, because mm. it's the same. It's a good song. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I wasn't going to sit down and write, so I just had like notes on my iPhone, which I scribbled away at every day, but I wasn't going to yeah. Take the time to, to do that, and that weighed a bit of stuff. You know, waterproof trousers, I actually got rid of. What else? And then certainly after winter, I got rid of a lot of stuff because I needed to buy a load of stuff before winter. It was so frigging cold. So then when that started to get warmer, 
I could leave them by the roadside, like big boots and extra trousers. And then I sent some stuff home, like big down jackets and extra hats mm. and mitts and things like that. Ski goggles, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, stuff I wish I had. I just not, I don't, I don't wish I had extra stuff. I probably wish I had spent more time getting the right rear rack or the right front rack or the right panniers. Yes. You know, because mine are fine. They're fine. And they sort of work. But I sort of wish, I look at other people's setups and I go, yeah, you've, you've clearly thought about that. <laughs> Whereas I was like, all league panniers, eBay, secondhand, great, I'll take this one. And then you realize it's not made for cycle touring. And that rack you bought, which has now got so much gaffer tape and so many cable ties, you probably yes. would have been better off getting the right one. And my front rack with its cable ties to keep it up, you go, you should have just bought the right one the first time. Yeah. So yeah, actually, my front rack is, uh, I had to replace because I went down a track in Austria and uh, yeah, it mostly came off and I had cable ties for about a month holding it together. Well, that's, that's what I have, but I'm so yeah. stubborn about spending money on the new kit. So some stuff I'm happy spending money on and some of the time I could be like, well, I can get by with that. So then I get by with that, but it's definitely not as it should be. Yeah. Um, and I've had that a lot with the bike. You know, even like fixing stuff on the bike. I, I see these some people like, oh, I change a chain every like 2,000 kilometers. I could freaking hell. Just because of like prevention is obviously better than a cure. And, and I really like to push this stuff and be like, how far is this going to go? But what that means is you end up with these long segments where you're like, I've now got one gear. Or yes. I have no brake. And yeah. because I should have sorted this a thousand kilometers ago, but I didn't. So I'm now going down this ludicrously steep road, just jamming my feet into the floor because I have no brakes. Nice. And then you get to a bike shop and they're like, you have no brake pads. And you're like, no, it's been like that for quite, I don't know what this noise is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yes, I'm just very stubborn. I'm like, no, I can get by. And then you go, okay, now it's reached a level. That's an interesting approach. I, I really suffered from that though um, recently because I've actually, you've, you've surpassed me in kilometers by a fair amount, but I got to about the 10,000 kilometer mark and I got to Delhi and um, I've been replacing chains. Like I only replace a chain if it breaks. That was my criteria. Yeah. If it breaks, if it breaks, I actually take a link out and put it together again. Yeah. And if that, once that breaks, then I replace it. Unfortunately, what, uh, what happened over the last sort of 5K or maybe a bit less, is that um, because the chain had stretched, it wore the main chain ring out completely. No, that like, happened me. Oh, for nothing. So, and inevitably, that chain ring they don't distribute apart from in Europe and the US. So, I'm have at some point I'll have to have that shipped to me. But for now, I've got missing my main chain ring for the next however many thousand kilometers. Yeah, I did. I'm glad. Yeah, I did the same thing. I ruined. I ruined my front. I needed to get a new crank actually because yeah. I wore it through. And the problem is, and this is in Laos, and it's so hilly in Laos, and you couldn't, oh, God, it was a nightmare. Because as soon as you put pressure on the pedals, it just skips over. It skips around, yeah. yeah. So you're like, I have to go so slowly, which annoys me because I like to cycle fast. <laughs> and then I can't put pressure on the pedals. And then I'm pushing up the steep hills because I have no gears. You have very few brakes going downhill because you have no brake pads and you've got one gear. And it, I eventually rolled into the NTN and I, I, this is unsafe. I'm unsafe and uh, not comfortable, but I, I eventually fix it. But um, yeah, it's all part of the journey. Yeah, absolutely. So describe your, your cycling route so far. Oh, the route. Okay, so... Uh, well, so left left the UK and then head down straight down to France uh, to stay with a friend and then pretty much headed east. So this is in from like Nice or something in the south through Monaco, east, east, east towards uh, Romania, Bulgaria, which was fantastic. Had a really nice time going through Transylvania, um, down through Bulgaria, along inland turkey for a bit and then the black sea uh into georgia over some ridiculous mountain passes there um azerbaijan uh across the caspian sea and then <laughs> then my route took a slight turn because there's a there's a t-junction in kazakhstan um which is you either take a right and go to uzbekistan 
-hmm. and go through the Pamir Highway, the old Silk Road, which is what yes. I think ninety five percent of cyclists I've come across do. Um, or you take a left, and if you take the left, you're basically stuck on the Kazakh Steppe for two months, or like four thousand miles, or three thousand. Oh, wow. Like it's it's that big a decision. Uh, because there's pretty much one road that just skirts all the way around Kazakhstan uh, up to Siberia, pretty much. And so I took that, which was great. Um, so you now look at, or if I now look at my roots being based in Singapore, you see this huge bulge, which <laughs> is logically heading southeast and then just whizzes up like that for no apparent reason. Um, so I did that in Kazakhstan, which was amazing had a very, very cold winter in Siberia and Northwest China. Um, spent a couple of months going through China and then uh, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, here and then here. I know you're there, nice. Great. Yeah, that, um, I'm, very, I'm very jealous of, the, of your Kazakhstan experience. Like I say, before we, uh, before we started the stream, we were talking about the fact that I jumped from straight from Georgia to India to spend my winter here on the beaches, but it sounds like you had a much more uh, extreme time in over the winter in Kazakhstan. What what was it like? How do you deal on a bike with? I suppose you, the mountain ex, mountaineering experience and the kit knowledge from that must come in handy. But how do you actually deal with cycling in incredibly cold temperatures? Uh, it's it's quite something. I so I, yeah. It, in some ways, again, this whole bank of experience thing, like. I guess from you know a lot of time in the army and being outside in different weather that probably helped you know those climbing experiences they probably helped but I still felt like it was a whole new experience that I was very much learning learning through and you know I arrived in Astana and it was the end of autumn so it dropped down to I think minus seven or minus ten or something which was wow. And but that was that was fine. That was that, that's a, that's a nice temperature. Okay. And I was in Astana, and it every and I was waiting to get visas and stuff. And every day was just getting colder. And I remember setting off, and I had a load of new kit. You know, I needed to get tires with you know snow tires with spikes in them, and big down jackets, and these big like fleecy hats and mitts, and big these Kazakh cold weather boots, like a lot of equipment. A, a wolf alarm on the front of my bike because wild wolves are a big thing there. Like, it's a really extreme place. And I set off in this snow blizzard, and I was like, this is so bad. And it wasn't that cold then, but it was just a snow blizzard. And then it just got just so cold. Like, unbearably cold. You know, minus 30 at night, almost every night, and then minus wow. the coldest. Like, I couldn't. It's really hard to describe, actually, that sort of cold on a bike. Um, ironically, when you're cycling, it's okay. You, know, you wouldn't need that many layers. Um, you know, I would cycle fine, and I had these big boots and trousers and wear maybe a base layer and one other jacket because you're, you're warm, and I'd wear my hat most of the time. So that was okay. It's as soon as you stop. You know, if I took a stop for food and stuff, it'd be like 10 minutes, quick food, quick Mars bar or something, then off you go again. If you stay longer, you'll just, your sweat freezes. It, that mm. aspect is never hard. It's just the logistics of cycling in those temperatures are incredibly difficult. Um, because it's winter, so there's not much light, so you don't have that much time actually on the bike. So every single night, the logistics of frozen food, frozen water, everything frozen in your tent. Like you can't even get your phone out because that stopped and then your fingers stop, like your feet get really cold. I can only just feel my, it's my toes actually in the last few weeks. Really? Ev wow. Everything is just really hard. Um, and every night I go to bed and my thermorest is why I'm so bitter about blow up mattresses. It carried on deflating. So <sighs> Yeah, yes. Every hour I blurred up and then it would deflate and I would just be lying on basically just frozen ice. And it, it was it was unbearable, actually. I just don't want to do it again. I mean, it was good, yeah, I guess like a good experience to get through, but it was really bad. Um, <laughs> and I found it very, very demanding, like mentally, physically demanding, but mentally just, you know, the idea that you get to your tent at night and you got the next... 14, 15 hours just lying in your tent in minus 30. 
with like three sleeping bags and like five pairs of socks and three gloves. You're just lying there like this is really unpleasant. And then sun comes up in the morning and it gets a bit warmer, but then you have no motivation to move. And you're like, I don't, I don't want to do this again. And you have <laughs> internal dilemma every day. And yeah, it took its toll. Um, That's incredible. And how, how long were you in those conditions for? So those sort of conditions were probably a month, I reckon. Um, from Astana, Northwest China, was was pretty chilly and then it started to get a bit warmer but yeah so proper down jacket stuff for a good month and a bit wow that's incredible that's after, yeah, the end of november until i reckon mid-january so maybe six weeks actually was was pretty regularly unpleasant and it only got better mid-jan and then even then it wasn't warm i think it only started to get what i would say warm in vietnam um, I when I could wear my sandals, it was, yeah. it, was yeah. it was quite bleak. But wow. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's it, that's why I'm so appreciative to be in Southeast Asia. I think, yes, because uh, I knew I knew as well that I had a friend in Tbilisi, um, and I didn't have another friend who I'd see on the road until Laos, which was about five months, and about seven thousand kilometers later, or so seven thousand miles later. And in that time, I also never saw another cyclist. So for like five months, 7,000 miles, I didn't see a friend and I didn't see another cyclist. And I couldn't, I couldn't quite fathom it. Um, so it was a real like, mental toll as well. Um, yeah, I can't imagine that's such a long time to go without contact. How did you deal with it? Did you manage to sort of call home and, and speak to family yeah. at various points as well? Yeah, I spoke to spoke to people a lot. It was just, um, and actually, you know, you start to just adapt to the environment you're in and you don't even really think about it, but you then see a, you see a friend again and, you know, you have a hug and they're nice to you and they cook and things like that. And you're like, oh, that has a big impact. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a very interesting process. But it's probably not one I'll queue up to do again. <laughs> and uh, so, obviously, that was probably one of your toughest experiences. What, on the flip side, what country have you felt kind of most at home in? Is it where you are now in Southeast Asia or Laos or Vietnam um, or back in Europe? Most at homes. Oh. I, I guess, like, I felt really happy going into Vietnam from China because I found China a real, like, social strain. Because I think doing it by yourself and certainly the places I went to, I felt constantly isolated. And it's ironic because you're in the most busy country in the world, you know, the largest population. And I felt totally alone, um, mm. which I didn't like. I didn't like people staring at me all the time. I didn't like people just walking up and taking photos. You probably have the same in India. Yeah. Yeah, I've struggled with that in India a little bit. The, the selfie obsession is uh, gets a bit tiring when you have a queue of mopeds beside you on a busy highway, tr yeah. weaving in, trying to get a selfie while you're uh, trying to avoid getting hit by a truck. Even that, I wouldn't mind selfies. Selfies I'm all right because you're actually involved in a selfie. What happened in China was just people walking up, like crowds of people just walk up and just like take a photo, bang, in your face and then walk away again. And... Yeah. Having like 20 people walk up to you and just take a photo of you and walk off, I, I didn't like at all. Mm. I felt like a zoo animal. And so I, I didn't enjoy that. Um, so going to Vietnam was a huge morale raiser. Um, and then South, Southeast Asia has just been really nice. Thailand, people were lovely. I had friends there, same in Laos. So yeah, they were all lovely. Um, Slovenia was great as well. I had such a nice time there. Really fond memories. And that country I've been to a few times now. And every time I go there, I'm like, the people have been brilliant. Scenery. Yeah. Great place. Ah, that's good. And it's a little closer to home, so a good place for people to, to yeah, check yeah. out. Yeah, exactly. You could, as much as I endorse people, I don't know, go to Kazakhstan, they're like, unlikely to do it with Slovenia is a couple of hours away. I think it's such a gem. Um, yeah. 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 I was really, uh, I fell in love with Eastern Europe, particularly Bulgaria for me, just because I had a friend there and I ended up staying for two months. And uh, it's one of the most underpopulated countries in Europe, at yeah. least, if not the world. So 
just uh, you know within a, within a two hour bus uh, two hour bus ride you can get to a thousand meters up to a paragliding launch on, yeah. on the mountain Vitosha. and then you know I cycled with a couple of friends that I made there and um, we went on the old highway to Plovdiv and we spent two days didn't see a soul uh, yeah. on the entire road camped out had like in India you know I struggle you can struggle wild camping because there's so many people but in yeah. Bulgaria we had huge bonfires going and yeah, uh, yeah you know almost roasting, roasting marshmallows on the fire and that yeah. kind of thing. So you know, incredible of, parts of Europe you don't see. Do you know, find that in India and China, they're, they're huge countries and you can't find anywhere to camp. China, you yeah. can find anywhere. Just so busy, there was nowhere to camp. Yeah. And, yeah. Bulgaria, I liked a lot. Great yogurt. I did, yes. I, I did prefer Romania, actually. I was very fond of Romania. Ah, yeah, I missed Romania, so... um have to get there at some point. I've heard good things there as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's just. I mean, I basically went there to cycle one road, but it was absolutely worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful parts of the world. Yeah. Cool. So we touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, about the sort of money and the funding side of things. Did you consider uh, sponsorship uh, or even charity support for for the cycling trip as well? Uh, for this trip. No, not, I mean, well, I considered it, yes, but I opted against it um, because it's a big thing on this trip was being, was like freedom and being like mentally and physically free as well. And I think part of that was an escape from the army because I've, you know, certainly in the army, I'm not very good with rules um, and being told what to do. I, I never really have since I was a kid. And so, having that in the army for a long time is is it's not it's not that great for me so a big thing was to actually just be free and the secondary effect of that is is having sponsors and stuff a is very hard to get and i think i would feel an obligation to act in a different way or post things up and a slightly false way perhaps on social media if yeah. I had sponsors um, and I thought if I didn't then I could just do what I want and not feel an obligation so I basically after I decided to leave I had a 12 month notice period and then just first few months was spent trying to find a job but then when I decided to come on this I just saved money so I, I sort of have money enough that will hopefully finish the trip um and i live a you know like you as well i try to live a pretty austere lifestyle when i'm actually cycling and then stay with people along the way but if i don't have anyone to stay with i probably won't stop in a city or mm. i'll end up camping so yeah you just um you find a way of of trying to live a lifestyle based on your budget but no i didn't sponsors would just it just added a dimension i try to avoid Hey, if, yeah. somebody, if somebody came along now and said, we'll give you loads of money to do it, and I'll say, thanks very much, I, I'll take that. Um, yeah. But I didn't want to like sell myself to try and get sponsorship. Yes, I totally understand that, uh, that urge. For me, it was, uh, it was an interesting decision. I definitely considered it for a while, but you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to be able to sustain a trip through working along the way. And um, I totally agree with the freedom that you get from from that um, is pretty important to me as well. Um, I've heard some stories of basically, you know, if you get sponsorship, you're now working for that company. Your trip becomes a, a promotional campaign for whoever your sponsor is, which um, I've heard is pretty tough. And um, yeah, I wouldn't, I, yeah, go on. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that as much. I just, and I actually think if, if I was to get a sponsorship, I'd like to think that it wouldn't actually change my trip at all. And they'd be sponsoring me, but I would. I would just be continually doing the same thing. That's what I'd like to think. Um, but hey, right now I'm I'm happy to do my own thing, so it works. But um, hey, who knows? I don't really know where the trip's going to end. So yeah, yeah. What is your what is your plan from from Singapore? Uh, so I fly to Darwin, uh, Australia, in four days. Four days, which is exciting. Um, so for me, it was always, I remember flippantly, actually, I had a girlfriend um, before I came on the trip, before I decided on the trip anyway, and she was like, what were you doing if you would leave the army and you weren't with me? And I said, well, I don't know, like cycle to Australia. 
I said it quite flippantly. Um, and then that was always the aim. Australia was always the aim mm. because I haven't been here and I've wanted to come to Australia for well, like 15, 20 years and still haven't. So I'm really excited. So basically I fly to Darwin and then um, head to Sydney, um, which is great. So I'm basically going to spend a month going well straight down south through the outback. Um, yeah. yeah, so down Sydney, well, down, yeah, down. Not the coastal route, the central route. Yeah, which I think is cool. I think it's it's different. Well, it's different because most people go to Perth and then across, or they take the coastal route. But I thought, no, like there's a three thousand kilometer road, just take it on. So I think that'll be quite fun. And then uh, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, and then I fly from Sydney to Invercargill, south of New Zealand, then up to Auckland. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, which will be cool. great. I'm there in winter for New Zealand, which isn't perfect, but it's one of those things. Um, yeah. But no, I'm super excited. Oz and New Zealand have always been the target, just in terms of like places to go. But I was also convinced if I ever went there, I'd want to stay there. So we'll see how that one works. Ah, yes, you might never come back. I might never come back. But I, uh, after that, I don't really know. I have a slight dilemma because I'd need to get home somehow. Um, yeah. And you either fly home or you cycle home. And I haven't quite worked out which is the best option. And if I cycle, where do you cycle? Africa, South America, North America? Hey, one of them. But I don't know which. <laughs> Exciting. Well, uh, yeah, well, I'll be keeping an eye on where you are. Um, I've got a couple of questions to wrap up. Like We've been chatting for such an amazing amount of time. I feel like uh, we keep on going forever, but uh, alas, we'll have to wrap up at some point. There's a couple of bits that I just wanted to end with. Um, reading your book, I found that the quotes that you had in there were really inspiring. And I, um, yeah, I've really, I've, I've not been reading a lot of adventure books while I'm traveling. Sometimes I need that break from, oh, yeah. from the actual adventure to travel. But um, I'm keen to hear what adventure books, or even not necessarily adventure books, just what books um, in general, you you would recommend to other other fellow wannabe adventurers or current adventurers? Oh, oh okay. Uh, uh, this is, it, it depends what type of writing you like is the problem, or like yeah. adventure books, um, because so there's different writers. Like, like Robert McFarland's an amazing writer. He's one of my absolute favorites. He wrote a book called Mountains of the Mind, which is beautiful. He's a, he's a beautiful writer, but he writes about nature and psychology and why people do it and just beautiful um like alan Botard does an amazing one on the art of travel alistair humphreys is always a good person to go to when it comes to adventure um yeah this i mean Bear, bear's book started me climbing ed hillary's book randolph finds i love his autobiography he's he's um yeah there's so many I, the Erling Kaga, who's a Norwegian explorer, he wrote a book called Silence, which mm -hmm. I absolutely loved, which you, some people will probably read and be like, this is very pretentious, but I absolutely loved it. <laughs> um, it's just the impact of silence and reflection, really. Um, but I like, I, so I find the psych, psychology books fascinating. Um, or like, just rather than simply adventure books, and it goes back to like, to, to my climbing book, I could have written that just on like climbing, but then I think it's boring. I'm I'm more interested in what goes on up here, mm. and certainly if when I, you know, and I'll write a book on this trip at the moment. But the way I'd write a book on this trip wouldn't just be oh I travelled to this country, the people lovely, the food were nice, which is great and it's a nice travel book. Mm. But I find the more interesting bit, and that's how I you know it's not how I write my blog, but the blog needs to be written in that way. Whereas if I wrote the book on it, it would be a lot more about the psychology side of it because I think that's more interesting and what goes on up here, um, especially if you're by yourself for like however many hours a day. Like that's what, and the, the highs and lows that go through your emotional journey because that's actually the bit that people relate to more than the mountains in China were amazing, which sure, great, but that doesn't really it doesn't really give an insight into what it's like to actually be in China by yourself. So anyway. What about the experience? A.A. A. Gill. A.A. Gill is my favourite writer. The best of A.A. Gill is such a great book. Um, yeah. Hey, there's 
I got. Yeah, that's a huge list. That's brilliant. Um, I have a lot on the list there. And then the final one, which I've a uh, question which I've stolen from uh, Gavin McClurg, who's a paraglider uh, pilot, and he he has a podcast called The Cloud Based Mayhem, which is one of the very few paragliding podcasts out there where he interviews a lot of top um, top uh, pilots in in the sport. Um, but his one is. It was quite interesting, Ender, and I, um, I think it's quite a tough question, but I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on it. And it's, it's pretty simple. What, based on all the experience that you've had, <laughs> what would you, what's one thing would you tell your 18 or 17 year old self um, that you think would help, uh, help you back then in the adventures that you were doing? Um, advice to a 17 year old self, yeah. I'm the easy answer is to be like, okay, cool, you know, have, well, no, I'd still say it, like, have faith to, you know, follow a path that you're taking that's not the conventional one. I think, I think that's a, I, I think that's important. And I've had that with doing those climbs and doing this cycling trip, like, they weren't the normal route. Um, and and I'm, I'm grateful I've done that. I've made those decisions to come out here and do that because it's quite, I find that's actually the scariest bit and the opportunity cost constantly comes into your head about what else you could be doing. So I think having, having the faith to, to just follow through with that instinctive thought that a lot of us have and usually just put to one side is quite a good thing to do. And then otherwise just, I don't know, just be compassionate and kind to people. And treat others as you want to be treated like it sounds it sounds incredibly basic but i still don't understand and certainly you come on a trip like this and you're the receiving end of such kindness and hospitality and i got struck with someone the other day actually because i was explaining warm showers to him and someone i just met hmm. he went into quite an intense conversation with me quite early on which i probably i don't know about you but i find it quite a lot if i've just arrived in a city and somebody's bombarding me with questions yeah <laughs> i've been on the road for a month don't ask me about like the existential crises i'm having and anyway i was explaining warm showers he's like but i'd never i'd never do that i'm far too selfish and i'm like but why would you not and he said well because like, why it's my i i did this and i was like yeah but on like a moral or ethical level why wouldn't you want to help someone mm. like you saw someone down in a worse position you could like why would you not he was talking about hosting. He would never host a cyclist, is what he's saying. Hosting. I can understand why people wouldn't host, but I was just talking about people stopping on the side of the road to help me and ask if I was okay. Mm. I would never yeah. think about doing that. Wow. And mm. I was like, you, you wouldn't even think about it? like you, Because a lot of people would think about it and not do it. And if you think about it and not do it, I was like, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah, if you think about it, then that's your subconscious saying, I can see that that person probably needs a help, but nah i can't be asked and um yeah so i got a bit struck and i was like well, why would you not on like a moral reason you, you should want to be good to people and yeah so i and speak to your family and friends just keep them happy yes speak to your mom that's... speak to your mom she gets unhappy otherwise call your mom that's perfect advice i love it great thing. yeah be kind be, be kind to people follow your heart and call your mom <laughs> Perfect. Thanks so much, Jody. Um, and so your book is called In Search of Sisu, and I'll put a link, obviously, uh, in the description for the video and on the podcast Perfect. notes as well. Um, and you have Instagram as well and anywhere else that people can follow the next uh, few months of your trip? Instagram's probably the best bit. I'll just yeah. mindlessly recreate or redirect people from there if I feel obliged to. Nice. And that's Jordy underscore Stuart, right? Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time. This has been unbelievable. Like I say, I've, uh, I feel like I've lost lost loads of minutes. We could have carried on chatting for forever. But yeah, um, then. yes, we'll have to do another catch up for your next adventure at some point, I'm sure. Well, I don't know how long I'm going to be cycling for. So, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we'll meet on the road at some point. Well, I hope so. I don't know what your plans are. Where, where are you going off Southeast Asia? So um, uh, my plans are very, very flexible. I've learned not to commit to being somewhere uh, yeah. too far in advance, but overarchingly, you know, my goal is to reach um, to reach as many continents as possible. I'm still trying to figure out if I can, from Argentina, I can jump across to uh, Antarctica for a little bit, maybe with the bike, maybe without it. But in the short term, I'm going from here in Nepal to 
um, back through India to um, uh, to Thailand, Laos, and then into China for a little loop, um, back to Vietnam and down to where you are in Singapore. And then from there, I'm hoping to go out to the in to Indonesia because um, there's great paragliding there. And then also to the Philippines, my friend Dan uh, from the other podcast episodes, he um, his dad lives out there. So hoping to meet up with him. And then from there, Australia and then North America, South America, Africa, and back home over however many years that takes. That's, yeah. Yeah. You got a big old trip there. Yes. But then again, I, like I was saying earlier, I spend one third of the year cycling and mm -hmm. two thirds in a place like this, working away on startup ideas and doing this podcast and mm -hmm. editing the videos. So um, my trip is a lot less of a singular adventure than yours. It's more of a son of a lifestyle, I'd like to say. An adventure lifestyle is what I've got going right now. Yeah, you're spot on. That's, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think there's a constant like craving to be away or not where you are. I had this with, discussion with a friend. You know, I'm really jealous of you living out of panniers, you know, because he's a a big explorer. And I was like, yeah, I'm jealous of you living your normal life in rural England. That's how. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, hey, it's the nature of being somewhere you're not. Yeah, it's always grass is greener. I feel like the the uh, since I've been riding, I've definitely still occasionally feel the urge to you know have that flat in in London or in Norwich and be able to see the family, you know, just in a 20 minute train ride. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've not got a lot to complain about. I think the thing um, that I enjoy as well is that in an expedition, I really enjoy the, I enjoy the preparation. I enjoy, you know, the highs of the expedition and the lows of the expedition as well. And then I really enjoy coming back and being in a warm place and having a shower after like three weeks of not showering and wearing the same clothes, washing everything repairing my therm rest and all that kind of stuff. So um, I get all of that yes. every every month or every two. Yeah, actually, um, I wish I could grab it now. Like it's it's a pin cushion. It's a, it's, it's a real, I didn't bring it up when you mentioned it, but um, I've had to, I've used about three full repair kits so far on my therm rest and it still has a slow puncture. So I still have to pump it up. Does it not then make the question why you still have it? Um, yeah, it should do in theory. It's uh, it's just because it's so small. I've got the women's ultralight one, <laughs> so it's so tiny. But it doesn't work. There are three or four of them this trip, and yeah. I've eventually gone. You know what? This is not worth it. Yeah. Right. So I just have a really crappy roll mattress now, which is not as comfortable. But I I just lost my patience with those. Have you got the one with the foam it, with a slight bit of foam in, or the Neo Air one though? The I have the Neo Air one. Yeah, I mean, mine is not that one. So mine has foam in it. So it's not quite as small, but it's, it does still give you some insulation if it has a... So basically, mine, I had yeah. another one in China that, that broke as well, which, yeah. was, which was a foamy one. I, I just go, they're, they're always going to get a puncher in it. And it's yeah. so annoying. Yeah. But mine is less comfortable. I'm like, it's not going to get a puncher. But <laughs> hey, this, this, is, this will be a debate among cycle tours for generations yes yeah to therm rest and not to therm rest yes. well uh yeah thanks very much we'll uh catch up shortly um and yeah good luck with your uh rest of your ongoing cycle and i'm sure you have lots of future adventures as well thanks very much ben it's been a pleasure cheers jordy bye bye bye